1973, he began practicing Krishna consciousness in New York City and shortly after began serving at New Vrindavan Farm Community in West Virginia. Maharaj received initiation in 1973 from His Divine Grace, I.C. Bhakti Vedanta Swami Shira Prabhupada. And in 1986, Maharaj accepted the sannyas order and began preaching in uh, Cincinnati and Columbia. And in the uh, 1990s, he became involved with the Scone Prison Ministries in America and began visiting inmates holding programs along with writing letters to inmates and sending in Shri Prabhupada's books. Uh, in uh, 1995, Maharaj began serving as the resident sannyasi in Chicago, where he is based today. At present, Maharaj preaches in America, India, West, uh, Western Europe, Slovenia, uh, Croatia, Italy, and in New York. And today we have got Maharaj in New Zealand as well. Uh, and he is the initiating spiritual master within the SCON Society. So on behalf of uh, SCON Auckland Maharaj, a very warm welcome to you. Thank you so much for accepting uh, our invitation and being with us. So all over to you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine Namaste Sarasvati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nivishesha Shunyavari Pasyatya Dev Sitarine Vancha Kalpa Turu Vizcha Kripa Sindhu Ve Vacha Patitanam Bhavane Vyo Vaishnave Vyo Namaho Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitana Prabhu Tananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasavi Gaur Bhaktivinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Today we are uh, honoring the Supreme Personality of Godhead in one of his most amazing incarnations known as Sri Vamanadev. The Lord has in incarnates in many manifestations of himself for different purposes primarily to uh, uplift the devotees, to rid the world of demoniac influences and reestablish true religious principles. Krishna states that in the Bhagavad Gita. So from time to time, it's required throughout the history of mankind for the Lord to appear on one planet or another, somewhere in the material universe is to perform one or more of these activities. So we read in the Srimad Bhagavatam in the eighth canto about the pastimes and appearance of uh, Sri Vamanadev. Um, the story starts way back where in the demigods were um, attacked by the demons and it was a great fight. And in that fight, the demigods were victorious. And Bali Maharaj, who was the head of the demons, was quite severely wounded in the battle. Uh, he was taken to a particular mountain. And on that mountain, he was treated very uh, successfully by Sukaracharya which who later became his spiritual master. Actually, he was the spiritual master of the demons. Sukracharya had many, many powers, and so he was able to heal Bali Maharaj. And Bali Maharaj dedicated his life to Sukracharya, and because of his dedication to, his, to Sukracharya, Bali Maharaj, along with the demons, became quite powerful again. This time, after receiving that mercy from Sukracharya, the demons were invincible. So they headed into the heavenly planets again. And this time as they were approaching, the demigods could realize Bali was not, not only back, but back in a very powerful way. So the demigods were gonna to prepare to fight, but Brihaspati, 
who was the priest of the demigods, advised Indra not to fight at this particular time. There would be no victory. The providence has given supremacy to the demons. Therefore, it is best to hide for the time being. So the demons, I'm sorry, the demigods left the heavenly planets and without a fight, Bali and his followers took over the entire realm of the heavenly area. And he had conquered also the lower areas, the earthly realm and below that. And so Bali had became so powerful that he had conquered all places within the three worlds. Um, the uh, demigods were in a very difficult situation and um, they didn't know what to do. Of course, they went to Lord Brahma. Lord Brahma told them it's not the time right now. And so the mother of the demigods, Aditi, she was very much concerned about her sons, or well, many of them were demigods, including Indra. So uh, she uh, approached her husband and he gave her a particular vrata, austerity to perform, and she successfully executed this very severe austerity. Upon completing it, she got the darshan of Lord Vishnu. Lord Vishnu appeared to her and was willing to grant her wish. She asked that the Lord would appear and recapture the heavenly planets and reestablish her sons within the realm. Vishnu agreed and he disappeared. And after some time, that same Vishnu manifested himself as Sri Vamanadev. It's a beautiful description on the appearance of Vamanadev from the Srimad Bhagavatam and the later chapters in the eighth canto, how the Lord appeared. And I, uh, out of the different qualities, or you might say opulences of the Lord, there are six main. The Lord is, he is um, the reservoir of all wealth, all fame, all strength, all knowledge, all beauty, and all renunciation. So many times when the Lord appears in the material realm, he exhibits one or more of these opulences in full. In this particular manifestation as Vamanadev, he manifested his beauty opulence. So when he appeared, he attracted the attention of, of so many great souls, Lord Shiva, Lord Shiva's wife, Bhavati, um, uh, Kuvera, uh, Lord Brahma, um, well, Indra, many other personalities came and they all awarded him a particular gift. He received a danda, an umbrella, uh, a, a sacred thread, uh, a pair of underwear from his mother, Aditi, um, uh, Various types of uh, gifts were showered upon Vamanadev as he appeared in his beautiful dwarf-like feature. The Lord did not waste time after his appearance. He immediately headed to the assembly of Bali Maharaj to begin his mission. When he appeared, the demons became quite disturbed on his appearance. For Bali Maharaj, very charitably disposed and always eager to welcome, he saw that this beautiful young Brahmana came to his assembly and being inclined to the Brahmanas, he immediately approached and he could understand that this personality was very, very special. So he started to worship this Brahmana, who was actually the Supreme Lord, and offer nice prayers. He washed his feet in so many ways he pleased uh, Vamanadev. After some time, the uh, Lord was pleased, so pleased by the worship 
the Vamana Dev started to glorify the family by which Bali Maharaj appeared in. He glorified his great grandfather, <laughs> Harani Kashipu, who was killed by the Supreme Personality of Godhead in the form of Lord Nisringadev. He glorified Haranyaksha for fighting so valiantly against the Lord in his form as Varaha Dev. And of course, he mentioned being such a family, Prahlad Maharaj, the great devotee of the Lord, was also connected as the grandfather of Bali Maharaj. His father was Virochana, his son was Virochana, who became the father of, um, of Bali Maharaj. So the Lord just showered so much praise upon Bali. And Bali was very much pleased. And then Bali, then the Lord, um, uh, and no, actually it was, um, then Bali started to say, well, you are a Brahmin, you have come and I am very charitably disposed to the Brahmin class. So please give me the opportunity to grant you any wish you want. Please ask for me anything you would like. Vamana Dev immediately didn't respond, but he said, actually, what do I need? I'm simply a Brahmin boy. I need very little. So, and of course, one should not try to ask for anything beyond their personal needs. And then the Lord, Bali was insisted. So the Lord said, I, all right, I will take three steps of land. Bali was, was amazed and at the same time quite shocked. You're so small and you're only asking for three steps of land. And I'm prepared to give you anything you want. I own everything within the three realms of existence. So please do not insult me by asking so little. Please take more. But the Lord said, something very instructive for all of us. He said, one who is not satisfied with what he needs will never be satisfied. And he went on to describe that any, everything in the material world cannot provide satisfaction. And, uh, but Bali was insistent. Now Sukracharya, he was there listening to this whole dialogue and he became quite uh, afraid or fearful because he understood that this personality was the supreme personality of Godhead and he had come on behalf of the demigods and so he started to speak and he said actually you know Bali you don't know what you're doing this is the supreme lord he will take everything away from you with those three steps of land in fact he'll do it in two steps and then you will not be able to fulfill your promise and you will not be able to give him the third step. So it is understood according to one Shastra, he mentions one Shastra, that if a promise is not preceded by the, the mantra Om or the word Om, then that promise is not valid, one can change. And in so many ways, he tried to dissuade Bali Maharaj for offering all of these opportunities for the Lord to act on behalf of the demigods. But Bali was very insistent. And Sukhataria's arguments were based on Shastra, not main Shastra, but smaller Shastras, which say that if one's interest is at stake, then one can rescind or change one's, one's promise. Bali didn't want to hear it. He quoted, Bali quoted one verse from the um, uh, uh, was well, quoted in the Bhagavatam. It doesn't give a reference, but in that particular verse, it says, Mother Earth can bear 
any form of sinful activity except a liar. And Prabhupada goes on to explain in that particular purport that in today's age, everyone is subjected to the element of untruth. So in Kali Yuga, you hardly find truthfulness anywhere. And Bali, now the Lord is, Bali is saying that how can I, after giving my promise to the Lord, take my promise back? Well, he doesn't refer to him as the Lord. He refers to him as a, a, a Brahmana. I would rather give up my life, everything, than to offend a Brahmana. So Sukracharya ran out of arguments. And then he said, therefore, I curse you that you will be bereft of everything you own. But Bali was not disturbed by Sukracharya. That's interesting because Sukracharya was his spiritual master. It appears in this particular situation, he's disobeying his spiritual master, which, which is understood to be a great offense. But in this case, it wasn't. Why? Because the spiritual master is supposed to represent the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And Bali and Sukracharya was not, he was, he was acting against the will of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Therefore, he became Asara. Asara means useless, um, doesn't have any standing anywhere. So in this particular case, um, Bali was explaining that how can I give up, you know, my promise? I would rather suffer in hell eternally than to uh, offend a Brahmana. And of course, Sukracharya uh, ran out of his arguments and he became very angry. So, but it was interesting to note that this principle of following the spiritual master is an absolute principle. But in this case, it was changed because of Sukracharya's activities that were against the will of the Supreme Lord. So by Bali rejecting his spiritual master and accepting Vamana today, he was acting on religious principles. And so then the Lord, he said, okay, we'll take your steps. And the Lord took one step and covered the lower and uh, middle planetary systems. And in the second step, he expanded himself it's a beautiful picture in the Srimad Bhagavatam. You see the Lord in a very gigantic form, pointing his toe towards the upper realm. And then what he did, it punctured the coverings of the universe. And the Ganges River, which was flowing in the heavenly planets, started to flow down towards the lower planets. Lord Rama, seeing what was happening, he took out his Kamandalu pot, and he collected the water coming from the toe of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And he washed the feet of the Lord and he put that water on his head. So that was one of the three aspects of the Ganga's existence in the material world. There was two other, one was when um, uh, the sons of Sangara had offended Kapila Dev, and then Janava, Janava Muni, uh, actually by his power brought the uh, Ganga Devi to earth by his austerity. Janudu, Jan, Jan, Janudui, Janudui, Janu Muni, Janu Muni. That's why sometimes the Ganges is called Janu, Janu. Janudwi or Janu, it's referred to the sage king or the sage Janu. And, um, and now the Lord had captured the, the, the three realms, including the higher planetary systems. Bali is watching this, all the demons are watching this. And then the Lord turns to 
Bali, he said, you have promised me three steps. I have taken two and there's no place for my third step. Therefore, you have broke your promise. You should be punished. Now, it's interesting. The Lord became very heavy in treating Bali Maharaj. And he called for the ropes of the Suki, which is a mystic snake. And he came and he tied up Bali simply like an ordinary prisoner. And Bali's all tied up. Now the demons, along with the wife of Bali Maharaj, are becoming really disturbed. And uh, so the demons decided to try to do something, but the demigods also were there. And there was a big fight between the demigods and the demons right in the assembly hall. But Bali Maharaj immediately called for the demons to withdraw the fight, and they did. And at the same time, the wife of Vin Vidyavali, I think her name was Vid Vinyavali, she, uh, she started to worship the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Vamanadev, in such a nice way. There's an interesting story that is somewhat connected to another pastime, and that is um, the uh, sister of Bali, her name was Ratnabahu, I believe her name was. Um, when she saw Vamanadev, she developed maternal affection for the Lord, because the Lord appeared in his form as a, a dwarf Brahman. So her motherly affection came out towards Vamanadev. But then when she saw what Vamanadev had done to her brother and tied him up like an ordinary, she became angry at the Lord. So this mixture of anger and maternal affection later manifested in her taking birth in Vrindavan as Putana witch. She was formerly the sister of uh, Bali Maharaj. And now she appeared in Krishna's Leela as Putana witch. And we know the story how she was uh, liberated by the Lord by uh, sucking out the milk that she offered to Krishna from her breast. And at the same time, she, her life was also destroyed at that time. So now the Lord is insistent, where should I place my uh, third step? During that time or in, during this time, Prahlad Maharaj appears in the assembly hall and Bali Maharaj, he sees his grandfather, the great Prahlad Maharaj. And simply by the presence of Prahlad Maharaj, Bali understood what to do. And he said, my dear Lord, please place your third step upon my head. I surrender my life to you completely. The Lord was pleased with that, and then he placed his third step on the head of Bali. And of course, we understand Bali later became the great, the great Mahajan. Um, the Mahajans are great personalities that teach eternal religious principles, and Bali Maharaj is one of them. And he represents one of the nine angas of bhakti. And that is that he, he teaches the process of complete surrender. It's called Atman Ivedanam, giving up everything for the service of the Lord. The Lord was pleased by Bali's surrender and the Lord granted Bali a position in the lower heavenly planets. There's a series of planets in the lower realm that are as opulent as the heavenly planets. So he gave him one place on a place called Sutala and where Bali would be the king of Sutala and Vamanadev in his form as a dwarf would appear there to serve Bali by becoming his doorman. The Lord agreed to take the position of the humble doorman 
who would serve Bali in Sutala. So the Lord was very pleased by Bali. And then of course, the, the, the demigods regained their positions in the heavenly realm. So sometimes it takes the Supreme Personality of Godhead to rectify the anomalies. Um, the Lord incarnates in every age to uh, give people an opportunity to purify their hearts through the process of devotional service. So sometimes people say, well, what is the incarnation in this particular age? We don't specifically see that. We see Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, of course. But then again, what is that manifestation that can purify the entire world? And that is Krishna has incarnated in the sound of his name. Kali Kale Namarupa Krishna Avatar. Namahoite Haya Sarva Jagat Nistara. This is a verse uh, from Chaitanya Charitamrita, which describes that in this age, the Lord has incarnated in the sound of his name. And the absolute nature of the Supreme Personality of God is, is understood in relationship to his incarnations. So whether he appears in sound or whether he appears in his personal form or in any other form, that incarnation is absolute. So Prabhupada said, in this age, if we if we regularly take shelter of Krishna by chanting his holy name, we are completely and perfectly protected from the influence of the age of Kali. And we see in our present situation, there are many more, there are more difficulties coming on in different forms, oppressive governments, pestilence, threats of war, economic decay, impossible collapse. So many problems are happening now, more so than in uh, previous years. But the holy name is like that bright light in the darkness of this age of difficulty. So devotees seriously and regularly absorb themselves in chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra they can receive the full protection and full mercy of the Lord through his holy name. Kali Kale Nama Rupa Krishna Avatar. Kalo Doshanidi Rajan. Asti Echo Mahagun Kirtana Eva Krishna Sya Mukta Sangam Param Kali Yuga is just like swimming with so many faults. There are faults everywhere. That is the nature of this age. But the Lord has so merciful manifested himself in his holy name in this particular age. And that incarnation is very, very available. Where in previous forms of the Lord's appearance, when he comes in his personal form as, you know, as Krishna or any manifestation of the absolute truth, it's not so as merciful as the holy name because the holy name can be chanted anywhere at any time and one can receive the full mercy and protection of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So we are very fortunate to have Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mercy come in such a very direct and powerful way. Bhakti Vinota Kaur prays Ainache Asadi Maya Nasi Baralagi Hari Nama Mahamantra Lao Tumi Magi. Asadi means the medicine. He's come in this age with the medicine to counteract the ill effects of the age of Kalti. And what is that? Chanting the Hare Krishna Mahamantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. And I'll speak a little bit also about Srila Jiva Goswami, which is his appearance day also today. Um, it always falls on the same day as Ramana Dave's appearance. Um, 
Srila Jiva Goswami, Srila Prabhupada said, is the, was the most prolific writer of Gaudiya Vaishnav literature. He composed over 400,000 verses. His most famous work are the Sandarvas, Tattva Sandarva, uh, Bhagavad Sandarva, Paramatma Sandarva, uh, Krishna Sandarva, Bhakti Sandarva, and Krama, Kramya Sandarva. These are elaborate philosophical explanations of the entire science of pure devotional service given in a very, very detailed way by Srila Jiva Goswami in, these, in his works as the Siddharvas. Jiva Goswami also wrote one very sweet and very uh, powerful um, uh, explanation of Krishna's pastimes in Sri Vrindavan when Krishna appeared on earth from the time he was born to the time he departed back to the spiritual world, which is known as Gopal Champu. Very poetic expression of Krishna's leelas done nicely by two personalities who, who appear in the leela to glorify the Lord by explaining the Lord's glories to the residents of Vrindavan in a very um, uh, August assembly, we might say, that assembly of great personalities, including the Lord himself, uh, Snigdakanta and one other person, I can't remember his name, two personalities who appeared to glorify the Lord. So Jiva Goswami's work in Gopal Champu is a real masterpiece in spiritual knowledge about the Lord's pastimes in Sri Vrindavan. And Jiva Goswami has written so many other books also. And uh, in fact, he uh, is the most prolific and most voluminous of all the writers of the Goswamis of Vrindavan. So today is his appearance today. And he was the nephew of Sanatana Rupa Goswami who met Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Lord Chaitanya came to Rama Kelly to meet Sanatan and Rupa Goswami, Jiva Goswami was also there. But at that time he was a young boy. But seeing the Lord at that time changed his whole life and he became uh, fully dedicated to devotional service. So these are a few bits of information about Srila Jiva Goswami. So we'll stop there and we'll, uh, I'll turn it back over to you, Krishna Chandra. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Um, as requested, if you can share some of your uh, time with Srila Prabhupada. Um, yeah, there's not much to talk about. I spent my early days in, Sri, in New Vrindavan. Prabhupada came in 1972, 74, 76, and even earlier, 68 and 69. Um, I joined in 73. So I saw Prabhupada when he came to the community in 1974 for a meeting of all the leaders in North America at the time. In New Vrindavan at that time, I was, in, I, I was a cook in the Brahmachari ashram, and therefore didn't have much leadway to go to the lectures by Srila Prabhupada because my service was to uh, cook for the deities. So I was mostly in the kitchen during those times. So I did see Prabhupada a couple of times. I remember um, being in one of his lectures where Prabhupada spoke from the uh, seventh canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, um, the sixth chapter, Prabhupada spoke about Prahlad's instructions to his schoolmates, which is one of the most 
philosophical chapters in the entire Bhagavatam, Alad Maharaja's instructions. Um, uh, personally, I didn't have any personal association with Srila Prabhupada. We did cook for him. One time we made some sweets for Srila Prabhupada. And he liked it. Um, but I was always in the background, always involved with my service. So unlike a lot of the devotees who had personal association with Prabhupada, I was mostly always engaged in temple service during the time when Prabhupada was there. Although a few times I would go to the lectures um, and that was the best I could do at that time. So I didn't have any personal service, a personal association with Srila Prabhupada. In the year 1975, when Prabhupada went to New York, a group of us left New Vrindavan and we came to see Prabhupada in New York. And that's when I uh, was there in some of his classes. And also we went to a morning walk in, in um, uh, what is that? the biggest park in New York. I can't even remember the name now. It's the biggest Central park. Central Park. Central, Central park. park. Yeah, Central Park. So I got a chance to go on the morning walk with Srila Prabhupada. And I remember one thing he did say. Uh, he was walking along. And of course, in that park, the park is so big that it has roadways going through the park. So alongside of the walking areas, there were some cars driving this way and that way. So at one point, Prabhupada became very, uh, uh, I think, concerned. He stopped. He planted his cane on the ground, turned to some of the devotees who were with us, with him. And he, he asked us a question. He said, the, the man, he, he runs on four wheels and the dog runs on four legs. So what is the difference? And none of us, either out of humility or ignorance, either one, we didn't respond to Srila Prabhupada's um, question. What is the difference between the man running on four wheels and the dog running on four legs? And then Prabhupada responded, there's no difference. The business is the same. The man is running after sense gratification. The dog is running in the same way. The business is the same. There's no difference. Prabhupada kind of helped us to understand that the sophistication that goes on in modern society is just some royal addition of animal life. It has no, uh, nothing glorious about it, although people see it in that way. Prabhupada wanted to teach us that sense gratification in any way, in any form, no matter how nice it may look, is what it is, it's sense gratification. And it leads one away from the goal of life. So I remember that pretty clearly. And that's the only one thing I can remember from that morning walk. Uh, I wasn't one of the leading devotees I was always in the background, so in this morning walk, that's where I was, towards the back of the line with all the devotees there. But uh, I remember Prabhupada gave many nice lectures in New York. There was one lecture which he gave in New Vrindavan. And then after the lecture, no, actually Prabhupada just spoke. It was a lecture, it wasn't a formal class or anything. And then right after that, Guru Puja was um, offered to Srila Prabhupada. So one of our devotees from New Vrindavan led the Guru Puja. And the Prabhupada had his entourage of his father, uh, his devotees with him also. So when our devotee had finished the Guru Puja song, Guru Vandanam, he stopped right at the end of the prayer and ended the kirtan there. Prabhupada immediately looked towards one of his 
one of his sannyasis, I believe, was pushed to Krishna Maharaj and signaled chant. So he picked up the Madanga and then he started to chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Uh, some of us, including myself, was a little curious why Prabhupada did that when the, the Guru Puja song had completed. And then we later, later learned that the, uh, the Mayavadis, they worship the Guru. And the Sahajiyas, those who take things cheaply, they worship simply the Lord. But we as Vaishnavas, in our worship, we always worship the Lord along with his the pure devotee or the pure devotee along with the Lord. We don't separate the two. And so Prabhupada wanted to illustrate that by teaching us that when we sing the Guru Puja song, we should also include the glorification of, of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. In this case, the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. So I, I remember that particular incident quite clearly. Okay, these are some of the uh, bits and pieces of my association with Srila Prabhupada during his visit in New Vrindavan. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Um, so we'll do our question and answers. So for devotees, is there any question that you'd like to ask Maharaj? You're most welcome. Please unmute yourself and then ask. Um, Hare Krishna Maharaj, Danvat Pranam, all glories to Srila Prabhupada. Maharaj, um, what was that verse that uh, you had quoted from Bhakti Vinod Thakur? Uh, which quoted from which uh, scripture? As Asrai, something you had talked about the, when you were talking about the glorification of the holy name. Mahamantra. Oh. Towards the end of your class, um, talking about uh, Bali Maharaj. Yeah, there's. Um, I quoted two different verses. One is um, Kali Kale Nama Rupa Krishna Avatar Nama Hoite Haya Sarva Jagat Nistara, and that's in Chaitanya Charitamrita. It explains that the, the Lord appears in this age of Kali in the form of his holy name. And then I quoted another verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam, Kaler Doshanidi, Rajan Asti Eko, Mahakun, Kirtana Eva Krishnasya, Mukta Sangam Param Bhajan. And that's in the 12th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, I believe, third chapter. Um, describing that this age of Kali is an ocean that's described as a deep ocean of so many faults, but the one blessing, one boon, one great blessing is the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Thank These are the two verses we quoted. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you. Thank you, Sudharma Devi. Yeah. Maharaj, I was thinking when you glory, when you talked about you glorified Bhakti Vinod Thakur, and you said Asari something. Bhakti Vinod Thakur? Did I speak about him today? Uh, I think so. I missed a little bit of that. Um, anyway, uh, Maharaj, oh. I can listen to that tape. Yeah. Okay, I the word asara. I was talking yes, about. Asara. I was talking about sukaracharya. Yeah. Suk sukaracharya yeah. was the spiritual master of uh, the word asara means useless. Yeah. That's the translation. That sukaracharya, though he was a guru, had become useless because he had went against the will of the Supreme Lord. 
Yes, and you very nicely explained that the presence of the Lord himself was there. So as we know that uh, not listening to the spiritual master's instructions is an offense, but because Krishna was there in person, so that was not taken to be an offense. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. In that case, it was the Lord's instructions were superior to the Guru's instructions. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. I, I just want to thank you, Paul, for, for um, I really enjoyed your talk and you're so humble and it's lovely to see you on the Zoom call. That's all I want to say. Thank I'm you Harriet. Very much. Thank Hare you. My, obe my obeisance is to you. <laughs> I think Nanresh Prabhu has a question. Uh, Nanresh Prabhu, your volume is, uh, your voice is not coming up. So maybe speak up. Okay, thank you, Maharaj. This is uh, Nanresh Das. Uh, I'd just like to ask a question. Uh, Maharaj, you mentioned that the position of the Guru is special and Supercharya went against the principle because he did not represent the Supreme God. So in case where some devotees change the yeah, rules. Uh, what is the position? Um, I I couldn't hear everything you spoke. Could did someone else? Can someone else repeat what um, Nanda Raja said? Mm -hmm. Should I come again? Uh, great story. Uh, well, you mentioned that the Guru's position is absolute, and Sukhacharya did not follow. The lost instruction, so he became a self useless. But in case right. where a devotee changes his guru, and what is their position? Well, if the guru is in good standing, and the person gives up their guru who is in good standing, that is a very serious offense. Very serious offense. I was. I also witnessed that one time in uh, many, many years ago in our movement. Um, so yeah, one, as long as the spiritual master is in good standing, one cannot give up their spiritual master for whatever reason. It's like giving up <laughs> their relationship with the Supreme Lord because they accept the spiritual master at the time of initiation. Now, one may request their spiritual master that I want to, uh, I want to take another spiritual master as a shiksha guru. And that can be, that can also be done, but it must be approved by one's spiritual master. So shiksha and diksha, you can have one diksha guru and you can have Many shiksha guru. Shiksha means one who gives relevant instructions. So that's that's within the realm, or that's within the protocol of our society. One can do that with the permission of the spiritual master, but one cannot simply give up the spiritual master. That's a great offense. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, there's one more question coming uh, from the Facebook um, because you are on, also online there. So this question is from uh, Sumuki Mataji. So she is saying, Maharaj, although you have said you didn't have much association with Shri Prabhupada, you have maintained such a high standard of service. Can you please share what has kept you so enthused and inspirational to many for so long? That's an easy question. It's called the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. <laughs> I, find, I, uh, I have uh, Srila Prabhupada, when he came over on the Jaladuta, he wrote that famous poem, Markin Bhagavad Dharma. 
And in that poem, he glorifies the Lord, he glorifies the process of pure devotional service. And he also uh, very humbly ends the poem talking about how unqualified he is to do this work that he's been asked to do. And in the very end of the poem, he says, I don't have any knowledge and I don't have any, uh, he says, I'm without knowledge and I have very little something else. Well, but I can't remember what he said. He said, but he ends, he said, I have full faith in the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. So Prabhupada was able to convey that mood of the importance of chanting Hare Krishna. So if we make that our number one priority in the practice of Krishna consciousness, then we get a lot of mercy. Whether it's difficult or whether it's easy, it really doesn't matter. Chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra is so powerful. It will keep one connected to Krishna and fixed in devotional service. So when people ask me this question, which has happened many times, I give the same answer. It's the mercy of the holy name. And of course, the mercy of Srila Prabhupada coming through his instructions. Thank you, Maharaj. Um, is there any other devotees who would like to ask a question to Maharaj? You're most welcome. One question for, from Variasi. I heard that Putana in her previous life was daughter of Bali. Um, I think it was sister, but you may be right, it might be daughter, but I, I, was, I was remembering that it was his sister and not his daughter. But anyway, it doesn't matter one of the two is either daughter or sister. Maharaj, the complete question is then why was she trying to kill Krishna as Putna? She carried that anger towards the Supreme Personality of Godhead in her next life or in her life as Putna witch. She carried that mood of anger towards the Lord. That's the answer. Thank you, Maharaj. Any other devotees? Maybe last question. So I guess no. So we'll uh, request uh, His Grace Nana Rashfo to uh, say a word of thanks, and we can end the class. Here. We like you really thank you for giving your valuable time, valuable offering time here for our eight And we have a very nice wonderful appreciation. And we hope that in the future you also come and do your association. Thank you very much, Mara. Thank you. Thank you for your kind words. All glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to the assembled devotees, and thank you, Krishna Chandra Prabhu, for uh, organizing this Sangha. Thank you for accepting our humble request, and we <laughs> pray that in future you're going to also join us again and share your wisdom and enlighten us. So once again, thank you so much, Maharaj, and all glories to His Holiness, Chandra Mori Maharaj Ki. Jai. 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 Jai.